Okay. Um, sorry about that. So Dave has also worked, uh, spent some time working with uh, DC nonprofits, providing training to men returning from incarceration um, to help them start new businesses. And his mentoring program uh, was with native plant landscaping. He trained them to install rain gardens, bayscapes through DC's River Smart program. And for the past two years, he's served as habitat advisor for the Audubon Wildlife Habitat Program for Prince George's County, which is why we're all here. Um, so one of my objectives um, as the um, manager of environmental programs is really to um, kind of help our residents become more aware of our native species, what's native, what's, um, what's invasive. And so when we came across this program with the Audubon Society, it kind of, um, it's kind of twofold. It um, helps residents to um, learn about uh, native plants, native species, and invasive species, but it also helps them to uh, design gardens and um, learn about how to make their um, properties uh, bird friendly. So it was kind of like a win-win for all of us. So before uh, Dave gets started, I'm gonna turn it over to Kathy Schallenberger um, from the Audubon Wildlife Habitat um, Society. And she's gonna um, give you a, a little, um, a few words before Dave starts the presentation. Hi, my name is Kathy Schallenberger and I just wanted to jump in for a moment to introduce myself. Um, my husband and I started this program. Um, it's, it's just moving into its third year. It's been incredibly successful because the time seems to be right to do this. Um, and this evening marks kind of a, a wonderful um, benchmark because this time we're focusing on a specific community and um, we have the pleasure of having um, Dave take on being the coordinator for Hyattsville. Um, he's been with us since the start as a habitat advisor and done a lot of transformation himself from um, non-native to native plants and gardening and has a really extensive knowledge of native plants. Um, he's assisted us, us with propagation. Um, and so he's a, an, an amazing resource that you will continue to have in your community. Um, so with, without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Dave. Press stop, no, press resume. Right there. And why is it not working? Okay. Okay, we seem to have a little bit of a trouble with, we're gonna just do this again. Ninety, which is probably ninety plus percent of uh, of our uh, uh, topography. Now we we it could be miles and miles of uh, agriculture mono, uh, monoculture. It could be a densely dense artificial suburb, uh, valleys filled with kudzu, or an emerald green lawn, which uh, we see way too much of. Next slide. Uh, so let's see what happens. Uh, let's let's look at what's actually happening with these birds. Then uh, this breeding survey, uh, breeding bird survey data shows that uh, since 1970, uh, the breeding bird populations dropped by around 55 percent. Uh, next slide. And if you put that in real numbers, uh, that's in North America. That's 2.9 billion birds that have been gone since 1970. Next slide. So why, is, why are they uh, disappearing? Uh, 
it's basically the, the primary factor is a lack of a biodiverse habitat. Uh, now, the keys to biodiversity here, uh, I, uh, the, the real foundation to a biodiverse habitat would be plants and insects. I've, um, I've included these particular images for a reason. Uh, the first one is a uh, willow oak, uh, a native plant to here. And the second one uh, for insects, I've included a caterpillar. Next slide. Um, because when we talk about plants and native plants, typically what we're thinking about is uh, most people anyway, I always have in the past, uh, pollen, you know, they make pollen and nectar or they make seeds and nuts and berries. Next slide. But uh, we often aren't aware that the native, the, one of the main, uh, in, the main benefits that the native plants provide for our, our environment is that they provide a, a food source for insects, uh, mo most notably caterpillars. And the caterpillars are a vital food source for the birds raising their young. Next slide. And with regard to insects, uh, the insects provide food for native species and they provide pollination for native plants. So that's just a real small part of what the insects do. If we, um, Look at this, this is a really nice illustration of the complexity of uh, what insects uh, contribute to, to our ecosystem. Uh, on the right, you have soil production, you've got your dung beetles, you've got, you got beetles that, that uh, uh, generate soil through uh, breaking down organic matter. Uh, the next column you have a, as a food source and for pollination and uh, when you put all of these, all of these uh, things together, the insects provide a, a foundation for biodiversity and food security. Next slide. But the insects aren't doing very well. Um, in the last 10 years, uh, this, is, uh, this slide here shows you the uh, decline in these particular groups of, of insects. And that's just 10 years. Uh, and with uh, some recent research that's been done, uh, in particular in Germany, where a, a, a small research group actually was able to uh, go, you know, has been collecting this data for decades, um, they found that in that area, about 80%, there's been about an 80% decline in the insects. Uh, and we really kind of can't live without them. Next slide. So do we get depressed or do we uh, try to be hopeful here? Um, there's a, a, and you probably heard of him, Doug Tallamy as an entomologist from uh, Delaware, who's put together a, uh, a construct for how to approach this, uh, this, uh, eco this in environmental problem we've got with the lack of, uh, lack of habitat and diversity. Um, and next slide. What he's, what he's, the picture that he paints here is that 95%, uh, go back. Mm -hmm. uh, keep going, keep going right after Doug. There we go. Thank you. 90%, 95% of the countries. Uh, is developed uh, in those pictures I showed you earlier. Uh, it's logged, it's drained, it's grazed, it's tilled, it's paved. Uh, rivers are straightened, they're dammed, some no longer even reach the sea. Uh, air is polluted, native plant communities are decimated by uh, non-native species, and the natural world is carved up into tiny remnants. Next slide. I'm really nervous if I hit slideshow, it's gonna go away again. Oh, there we go. Okay. Give it a try. So, what's the solution here? Uh, next slide. Uh, Talamy's vision is that if we, if each American, you know, when we think about natural, uh, the natural world, uh, too often we're thinking of parks, uh, the national parks, uh, wildlife refuges, and those pockets of wildlife aren't enough. Uh, one. They're isolated from each other. They cannot provide na na uh, natural populations with the kind of 
connectivity that they need for to a broader population. Um, so we can bridge those. We can bridge those natural areas, those pockets of natural nat natural areas, uh, by basically creating a homegrown national park. But Tallamy says, "What if each American landowner made it?" I'm going. <laughs> Sorry. What if each American landowner made it a goal to convert half of his or her lawn to productive native plant communities? I mean, we have all of this uh, land that we're not using. Uh, even moderate success uh, could collectively restore some semblance of the ecosystem uh, ecosystem function to more than 20 million acres of what is now ecological wasteland. Next slide. So we can control, his point is we can control our own property, our own little piece of property. And if enough people do it, we would be able to, in, to create basically an, uh, a very vast natural uh, uh, national uh, park. Mm. So how does the uh, uh, Audubon Wildlife Habitat, how do we, how do we plug into this? Uh, how do we help people create a homegrown national park? Next slide. Uh, as Kathy mentioned, we, we, we and, and Dawn, we uh, offer no cost on-site personal visits. Uh, next slide. So of course you can get this information online. I mean, you can basically find any, of course you can find anything you need to know about uh, native plant gardening, wild, uh, habitat creation uh, online, but it's often difficult to put that in practice and it's really hard to know where to take the first steps. And that's, that's where we wanna come in and help. Next slide. So what, what we focus on, you know, in order to make this happen, um, we have to have a conversation. We have a conversation with you about the specific outdoor space, the specific set of circumstances, a specific approach for that space, and those circumstances that you have. Next slide. So what, what should you expect from a visit? Uh, we have carefully selected information and in wildlife gardening that we bring to you. Uh, we walk through the property uh, and we let, for about an hour, we focus on our guidelines for creating habitat. Um, we help you set priorities and make manageable plan for moving forward uh, with a follow-up summary and further assistance if, if needed. It's, um, I've, I've found from my own experience and a number of people I've known who've, who've uh, started up gardening, it's very hard to, to, to go at it and not get overwhelmed because there's so much to do. And, and we really help you kind of make realistic, uh, realistic goals and, and plans that, to enable you to kind of grow into it and, and, really, and uh, find a rewarding experience. Uh, and then we encourage you to apply for Audubon Wildlife Habitat recognition. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, next slide. Uh, what happened? You can leave it there. Oh, okay. So stop there. Well, okay. <laughs> yeah, we're good. Yeah. So um, we have a, 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 a bunch of folks uh, that are in the program that have backgrounds in gardening and 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 uh, uh, and you know native plants and habitat and and uh, it's all volunteer group and uh, a number of us have been doing it for two years now and in those two years um, it's as Kathy mentioned it's, it's been an amazingly successful program. Uh, we've had 275 visits uh, in Mount Rainier, Brentwood, Hyattsville, Riverdale Park, University Park, College Park, basically every place inside, uh, you know, Prince George. I think we need to go back. Uh, oh my gosh. No, that's fine. No, we're good. I wonder, do um, you think it might be better if we went to that. If it if it drops again, we might just go back to that view, the not the slideshow, because the slideshow seems to be giving us trouble. But anyway, let's let's move on here. Um, we've had thirty properties certified. Uh, we've had fifty five habitat advisors trained. Um, we do. We had the program evaluated by an outside company. Uh, we 
Uh, and we've uh, developed a model garden. Uh, if you're, especially if you live in Mount, uh, in, if you ever go through Mount Rainier, you're gonna have seen it. It's in front of Joe's Movement Emporium. Uh, we, did, we installed a, a wildlife garden there. And we made connections with a number of local organizations. Next slide. So what does it create? What does it take to create this habitat? Next. Basically, we wanna make it, make it look like nature. Uh, no, it's, uh, but we're working within an artificial environment. So that's, that's uh, it's, it's, it, 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 it needs a little, little thought before you can, you can kind of get there. So we have a number of principles that we help you with. First of all, replace the lawn. Uh, Non-native plants and invasives uh, with native trees, shrubs, and perennials. Uh, most of our yards, uh, and then, because uh, this is where we are now. Uh, it's a sterile environment. It's an overview of a, a mm -hmm. Hyattsville. It's not Hyattsville. We're oh, not no. that bad. Okay. <laughs> but it, it's kind of... It, We're a little better it, than this, I think, already. <laughs> yeah, it gives you an idea. At least they have water in there. Uh, so we'll go to the next slide. So we really want to do is create something like this. Um, uh, it's a, it's a really nice, peaceful back, backyard, native habitat. It's good for us and it's good for the, for the wildlife. Next slide. But if you go to Home Depot, this is an sampling of the Home Depot's website. Um, you'd be hard pressed to find anything native there. And some of these plants are notoriously invasive, uh, but that's what we're offered in, in most commercial settings. Uh, next slide. So why are native plants so valuable? Um, as it turns out, uh, most native plants, uh, or most insects, like 90% of insects, uh, of plant eating insects and 25% of native bees, they only eat the plants that they've co-evolved with. Uh, for example, the milkweed <clears throat> is a perfect example, the milkweed and the monarch. And the monarch. Um, if you bring a plant from Japan, the chances are there's few, if any, insects that actually can, can use that, that plant. Next slide. And here's a good example. Uh, on the left, we have Nandina. It's a very, very popular shrub um, used in, in foundation plantings everywhere in the yard. It's from China. Uh, and on the right, we have Vixinium. It's, a, it's the blueberries and cranberries, that, uh, that bunch of plants. Now, the Nandina will support zero caterpillars. Um, no food for the birds. They can eat, uh, they, and the berries aren't good for them either. Uh, Vaccinium, on the ha other hand, has, supports 294 caterpillars. And it's not that the Nandina is a bad plant. It's not that these non-natives are bad plants. In their own environment, they support the wildlife. For instance, uh, Phragmites, it's a notorious uh, invasive plant in our marshlands. In its native habitat, it supports something like 170 uh, insects. Here, it supports five. So it's not that they're bad plants. They're just plants in their own place. Next slide. And we're not, we're not wild people who says, you know, we're not, we're not crazy, crazy people who are gonna say, get rid of every, every non-native in your yard. Uh, and, that, and that's not where we are and that's not necessary. The ideal goal, your long-term goal, if you wanna create a really healthy native habitat would be to have 70% natives. And um, things that, uh, and there are, there are non-natives that are perfectly fine and there are non-natives you really wanna get rid of. Like for instance, azaleas, they're beautiful plants, they're not invasive and uh, it's perfectly fine to have some azaleas in your yard. If you got Nandina, it's an invasive non, it's an invasive non-native and you probably, would be well to get rid of it. Next slide. Um, so the second principle here is to provide structure, uh, plant densely in layers. Next slide. Uh, an example of what not, what we typically see here, it's a magnificent oak tree. Uh, and we, as we said, oak trees uh, are, oak trees provide uh, 
food for hundreds of species of caterpillars. But the thing about caterpillars is when they're ready to pupate, they don't stick around. They need to go to someplace else. They need to go get away from that tree and either dig into the ground, find some leaf litter, or move to a nearby shrub. When you have a tree like this planted completely surrounded by kind of hard packed turf grass, there's really no place for those uh, uh, caterpillars to go. Next slide. Next. So this is a slide, this is kind of my uh, back. Back? Yeah, back to that diagram. Sorry, I think we have a delay here, so I... Uh, there. Okay, this is, uh, uh, it's part of the, the information that we give the homeowners, and it's a really nice illustration of basically how to create a community of plants. Any individual native plant by in isolation is, is gonna have marginal benefit. We're, you know, we're talking about creating an, uh, a landscape with layers. Um, and and the say in here we have the canopy layer and that's your uh, oaks, hickories, uh, the white pines, the sycamores, and then there's the mid-story layer, which is where you get your maples, sweet gums, junipers, uh, cherry, black gum, and then your understory where you have your shrubs, and then you've got your ground cover layer, which is the golden rods, the sedges, milkweeds, and and all of your lower growing plants. Every one of those layers is critical uh, to creating a, a healthy uh, habitat. And typically, uh, we're just not wired that. I mean, our uh, traditional horticulture isn't really, hasn't really emphasized that. So this is kind of new thinking for a lot of people. It was certainly new for me. Next slide. So we encourage you to plant densely. Uh, because the, if you get a dense growth of native plants, they all, that's the way they grow in nature. You're not going to have as much trouble with weeds. Next slide. Uh, typically, though, this is the way people plant. And you're dependent on mulch, you're dependent on weeding, and you just don't have a good, that's not a real community of plants. Uh, next slide. Uh, so how do you manage this? Um, first of all, start, if you're going to plant densely, start small. Uh, start in a small, don't dig up your entire law, law yard and hope to fill it densely right away. Uh, and as plants grow, you can divide and spread them in your own garden. You can team up with neighbors, divide plants and swap. Uh, you can learn to propagate plants from seed. Uh, if you're interested in that, that's something that I've been doing uh, and have really enjoyed it. And I'd be perfect, I'd be happy to teach you how uh, if you're interested in doing that. Uh, and you can look for ways to defray costs with sales and rebates, things like that. Next. Uh, when, you know, in a, uh, a native garden doesn't have to be floppy and sloppy looking. Um, it can be a beautifully well-designed garden uh, like this one here. You put pathways and borders like you would with any garden. Next. Uh, put habitat uh, elements like brush, brush piles in low, low visibility areas. Uh, and you want to put bird feeders where they're visible and the cats can't sneak up on the birds. Uh, you're going to have some floppy plants. You can support those. Don't let them flop. Keep the garden weeded. Uh, use lots of flowering plants. And uh, clean up in the spring, but in the fall, uh, we're going to get this later. You don't necessarily want to do a whole lot of fall cleaning and then put up your Audubon sign. Next. Uh, and you want to provide food. Here we have uh, a, a, a milkweed with a caterpillar. Uh, I think that's a monarch caterpillar. Mm -hmm. uh, we have some bees on a button bush. Uh, next. Um, if you put, you know, after you've grown this garden and everything's gone to seed, you have all this neat stuff and, and you've really created a wonderful kind of overwintering space for wildlife. And so if at all possible, if you could put off plant uh, cleaning up the plants, there's a lot of seeds, a lot of food and a lot of shelter for uh, wildlife that can uh, help them get through the winter. Next. And don't forget about other uh, animals, other wildlife, uh, the, your beautiful toads. 
<laughs> okay, uh, provide shelter. Uh, if, don't, if you're cutting a tree down, leave 10 to 15 feet of the trunk and it provides incredible habitat for insects and birds. Um, next, a uh, brush pile. Uh, a brush pile is, is very, uh, it's good shelter. And in, if you can find a corner in the yard where you can kind of uh, accumulate some brush, that, that's really useful. Next, uh, add birdhouses. Uh, it's a little tricky with all the English sparrows. So I have a couple hacks that I use to be able to uh, have some uh, birdhouses that uh, the sparrows can't uh, get into, but uh, uh, some, some artificial sh bird shelters are a really good thing to have. Next. And water, water's critical. It's a little tricky. Uh, you wanna make sure you do it in a way that doesn't um, uh, breed mosquitoes, but that's uh, pretty easy to do. And uh, having some water available for the birds is, is just really critical. Uh, next. And then there's the rain check program. Um, the uh, Prince George's County provides rebates for doing, uh, for taking up paving and for installing rain gardens and rain barrels. Uh, next. Now I took advantage of this at a property I had in Capitol Heights. Uh, and you can see my lovely garden there. Uh, it was just a terrible mess of multiple layers of crumbly pavement. Well, I applied for the rain check program and got qualified. And in two years, next. Wow. So it was, uh, and and this is a this is a testament to planting native plants from seed. Almost everything here I grew from seed. Uh, next, uh, this is the rain garden at the end of the property down at the slope. Next, and these are some of the plants that I, I planted throughout. It was um, it was uh, great. It's a great program. Really, I highly recommend you you take advantage of it. And they paid for every penny of it. I didn't have to pay for any of it. Um, so uh, next, uh, don't use pesticides. Probably don't need to tell you that, but uh, pesticides and artificial fertilizers um, are really not needed and, and uh, you're gonna do a lot more harm than good, most likely. Uh, next, and this is something, is a big lesson I've learned in the last two years is, um, if at all possible, leave your leaves. Um, you might want to rake them up in the front yard or something, but uh, if you could, if you need to clear an area, rake the yards under some shrubs or under some trees. Uh, there's a lot of insects over winter in leaf litter, and you're throwing all of those away. And um, and I've also found that doing it that way in our backyard, that's um, it's just ends up being a lot less work, uh, and you get a much healthier uh, little environment there. Next, uh, this is a list of uh, insects. Good, good insects, bad insects. I think you know most of those. Uh, next. And cats. Um, mm -hmm. and cats and windows. <laughs> birds, um, if you have trouble with birds uh, slamming into the, your windows in your house, uh, you can, uh, there's a number of products available that you can uh, apply to your windows that alert them that that's, uh, they shouldn't be flying through it. And it's, if you can keep cats indoors, it's really uh, outdoor cats have caused tremendous damage to the bird populations. I, I think, I mean, it's just millions and millions of birds are killed by uh, domestic cats. Next. And lighting. Um, this, is a, this is what our country looks like from above uh, at nighttime. Migratory birds fly mostly at night. Uh, the lighting messes up their navigation and sometimes they'll just fly around in circles until they kind of get exhausted and come down to, to the ground. It's, it's really difficult for the birds and it's bad for the uh, nocturnal insects. Um, it, uh, they, we don't know why they fly to the light, but they do. And it can really wreak havoc uh, with some of the, inse the insect populations. Next. And provide a safe haven. Put your uh, bird feeders in an area where the cats don't congregate or where they can't hide uh, and provide uh, shelter for birds to escape. Next. Can we do this? Um, I think we can. Uh, people have been doing it. Uh, next. 
it's been, it's not a brand new idea. And you can see you've been, for years, we've been seeing uh, wildlife habitat signs and monarch way stations, baywise signs. Next. And uh, this is exciting news on the state level. Uh, next. A uh, woman, Janet Crouch in Howard County, see this, oh. see this really trashy looking yard in front of her house? <laughs> well, she was told by her homeowners association that she had to tear it up and plant turf grass because it was unsightly. Um, and she was really harassed by that. Uh, and she ended up next fighting it. And we got a state law that prohibits, prohibits homeowner associations from uh, requiring uh, turf grass and not allowing rain gardens and pollinator gardens. Now, I have to hand it to her. If I were her, I probably would have just moved to Hyattsville. But <laughs> she didn't, she stuck it out. And we had her, you know, so a, a wonderful thing that she, she did for everybody. Next. Uh, and on the town level, uh, Mount Rainier, Chevrolet, and Hyattsville of all. Uh, embarked on programs to uh, collaborate uh, and to and to uh, help to provide these habitats. Next. Oh. Yeah. So everybody watching this presentation, uh, we're really so thankful that you're interested, and everybody here can can do something. Next. Uh, you can start transforming your own garden. Here's a lovely garden in Mount Rainier. Uh, sitting in that house right now but <laughs> uh, next and spread the word um, we hope that you're you've been able to pick something up from our discussion tonight and tell your neighbors um, and have us over to work with you and tell your neighbors about us too next uh, if you have a developed wildlife habitat in your property please let us know and um, we can uh, provide you, we can come over and provide you with a uh, Audubon bird friendly habitat sign. Next. So what do you need to get qualify? Uh, you need native, a certain level of native plantings uh, with the intent to continue de decreasing your lawn. Uh, you don't have to be there already, but there, you, have, you, we, you want you to be heading in the right direction. This is a multi-year process. It doesn't happen overnight. You need to have two sources of food, one source each of water, sheltering, shelter, nesting spots, and a commitment to clearing invasive species and a commitment to reducing pesticides, herbicides, and fertilizers. Next. And uh, then use your sign to get your neighbors talking. Uh, we've gotten 30 of these out already, and we hope to get it. We hope to, really hope to get a few more in Hyattsville. Next. We have 30 in Hyattsville. No, uh, 30, no, 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 30, the, the, the George's, yeah, the Prince George's program, yeah. Um, and uh, it'd be great if we could get, if we could get schools, houses of worship and businesses uh, that have big properties, if we can get them to buy in, to buy into this, this would, this would be amazing. Uh, next. Or join us as a habitat advisor. Uh, we do have, in one of the coming slides, we have the information on our up to, up upcoming habitat advisor training. Next. Uh, and that's right here. Um, it is uh, Wednesday evenings starting on February 8th and once a week for four weeks. It's a great training. Um, I've had it and uh, I really highly recommend it. Uh, next. And so yard by yard, you can transform this next <laughs> into this. <laughs> It's a Mount Rainier house. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the house of Mount Rainier. It just, it really is amazing. Uh, next. Um, so um, if you want to, we really encourage you to uh, sign up for one of our visits. Uh, uh, just, you can request, you can, uh, the email is here and these slides, this is all gonna be available to folks. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we'd love to hear from you. And we, we and as Kathy said, we, have, we're kind of forming a, a little subgroup in Hyattsville where uh, we should be able to really develop a community of interested folks. And uh, I, I'm really excited about it. Uh, next. Did it go? Uh, one more. Is that it? That's it. That's it. That's, That's it. it.
<laughs> Sorry. Okay. I hope we have some questions. We really apologize for um, uh, this. Was the first? This was the first um, Zoom talk I ever gave. <laughs> I'll probably be afraid, be afraid to ever do one again. <laughs> so, um, do you have any questions? See. I don't see any at the moment, so I just want to take a minute to uh, to talk about uh, to ask. I have a question, so I'm wondering um, if so. It doesn't. So Hyattsville, the city of Hyattsville, is promoting this, and if you get your yard um, Audubon certified, we we will provide the signage for the first 25 residents that have this done. And just to reiterate, um, Dave and Kathy, uh, we're looking, the way that we spread the word is through these advisors. So we have a few advisors in, in the city already, and they, um, they, we want to train more advisors so that we can get some more residence yards and to be able to help, um, help more of you. Um, and so Everything that Dave presented today is part of what this habitat training um, is going to entail. It's going to um, help you to have the the tools and the information to to help your neighbors um, with that. And it looks like we're getting some questions. So um, let me see. We do. We have some. Let's see. Um, oh, the presentation um, is going to is is being recorded now, and so it will be available on the website. And all the links that um, that Dave shared, um, pretty much everything that he has should be on our website under environmental, um, and it, including the rain check rebate program. Let's see. Okay, so. Ah, so Mr. Leo Tini is interested in learning to grow from seeds. So um, I had have some seeds. Con yeah, have him contact this uh, email at the bottom of this slide here. Okay. And uh, they will forward it to me. Um, I have been, I, I have, um, I learned, I've Brown. been growing things from seeds for years. Uh, and when, while at Chesapeake, I uh, did a lot of the propagation for Chesapeake natives and just fell in love with it. And I, I have a uh, set up in my basement and I'm happy to uh, show people how, it, how to do it. It's um, like that slide I showed you with the, uh, at Capitol Heights, that was, I grew, you know, well, I probably a couple thousand seedlings that, <laughs> You know, if you if you say six dollars times a couple thousand, you know, I saved a lot of money. And you and if you're filling in a big area, that's that's the way to do it. If you're interested, uh, I'm happy to I'm happy to do that. So, Dave, we we got a question about what advisors do. Um, so, if you want uh, yeah, to talk a little a good, bit about yes, that. I'll uh, I'll try that. <laughs> so, I'm an advisor, and so um, we get a list of a couple neighbors. And what we do is we first contact the neighbors and we have uh, some background information we ask them to look at. We have a film from Doug Tallamy that we ask them to watch just so they can get to be thinking about it and to be thinking about questions that they might have. Uh, then I show up at your door or we show up at your door and uh, we arrange a time and it usually takes around an hour. I've had some a little more. Uh, and we walk through your yard and we kind of ask you what your thoughts are, what your goals are. Uh, we give you ideas for how to, um, you know, it's a very site specific thing. And that's what's so good about it is because we're there to talk to you about your situation and uh, uh, everyone's different. And so uh, I have found being an advisor real i you know just very educational myself and for myself and uh and it just it's just fun i i hope that does that answer your question at all um oh see. yeah and then we write a okay i'm sorry i that's not everything we do and then <laughs> we write a summary uh and we send you a summary of the report with all the all of the recommendations and all that 
And then we offer to be available if you have questions. Okay. Um, they are rolling in. Should a brush pile be constructed in a specific way, or can I just throw a bunch of sticks and leaves in a pile? Is there an ideal size or specific composition of material? Okay, um, it doesn't. Have, I. Uh, it's pretty. It's pretty. Uh, it's it's pretty loose. It's pretty unstructured. You don't have to structure in a particular way. Uh, think in terms of what you find in nature. You know, trees fall down in nature and leaves fall down on them and, and things just happen. So uh, it's best to find a, a place where, you know, it's a little out of the way. Uh, you don't want any, anybody complaining about it. Um, and cut up sticks, you know, if you're trimming, if you're pruning your trees and hedges, just cut them up into sort of manageable sizes and pile them up. Uh, there's no specific size or shape, um, but um, you, uh, you do provide a lot of shelter. Um, uh, for individuals that want to, um, that are interested in the advisor training program, they would just email Audubon. Yes, that uh, this email down here, and then you guys yeah. would reach out to them to get them scheduled for the training. Right. Yes, we'd be very happy to. Uh, yeah. So if you're interested okay. in the habitat advisory training, um, you got the dates, and I believe Kathy, it starts at seven. Each each uh, yeah. session is. Yeah. Is an hour or two hours? Seven to eight thirty. Seven to eight thirty. And so, if you just email Audubon Wildlife Habitat um, at gmail.com, um, they'll get back to you and get you logged in and signed up for um, for the uh, for the sessions. Um, I think it's a great way to really learn, like everything that Dave was talking about. You guys are going to get that information. Um, so somebody asked about mosquitoes, avoiding mosquitoes in the water for the birds. Before Dave, before you speak about that, I just wanted to tell everybody who's here now in the city um, that um, just put up a little plug in. We are, I'm having a, a, a consult, uh, um, an intern's gonna be coming in, uh, start, it's gonna start in February and um, do some assessments, um, get some information together for residents on the reduction of mosquitoes. I'm really working on how we can reduce mosquitoes without chemicals. So we're looking at, um, so be on the lookout for that information. Um, we are going to have the intern doing some yard inspections to kind of really teach people where they hide and how to reduce them. So I just wanted to kind of put that little plug in that we will be doing that. Um, in the, um, I'm gonna say probably sometime in March, um, we're gonna be having some training, uh, some additional um, training on, on mosquito uh, populations and then having some yard assessments. And, um, you know, so we'll continue that throughout the, the, the season. Um, so Dave, mosquitoes. Um, yeah, um, it's, uh, if you have bird baths, uh, one easy way to do it is to flush it out every, say, twice a week, uh, rinse it out good. Uh, or if you're going to be on vacation or something, uh, are you, uh, if you're familiar with, uh, there's a product called Dunks, D-U-N-K-S. And it's like a little, looks like a donut kind of made out of cereal or something. And it contains a, a bacterium called Bacillus thuringiensis, which is a, a biological control agent, which will kill the uh, mosquito larvae. If you have a pond, uh, it's important. Um, you've got to have fish in the pond and you can buy these little fish they call mosquito fish or whatever. Uh, but we've, we've had pond for years and uh, the fish just gobble up the, the larvae. Uh, it's good to have the water moving. If you have uh, a waterfall or something, it does keep it, you know, keep things moving and they're able to catch things. But we've never had trouble with that. But uh, but do and I am I'm very excited about what Don just said about this train this because uh, uh, what the city's efforts in this in this area because I'm very interested in learning more. Yeah, there's something called a gat trap, and they they are um, targeted specifically to the the tiger mosquito, which is what we think we have. 
So this intern is a mosquito intern from the college and she'll, she'll be looking into making sure that's what we have. And if it is, then um, this, we have a program to offer discounted um, gat traps to people and educate on how to use them and that kind of thing. So uh, yeah, so I'm excited about that too. Um, uh, let me see, there's a couple other questions. Um, it is 8.03, you guys, if you don't mind, um, we will stay and answer a few more questions. Um, we had um, scheduled to be able to do that. Um, so if you'll bear with me, um, Dave is Pakistander. There's a native Pakistander, isn't there? Oh, yes. Um, yes, it's called, it's a common name is, uh, Allegheny Spurge. Uh, I have it. Uh, I have a several big clumps of it. Uh, but most of what people have, most of what you buy that's called Pakistander is not native. That's correct? an Asian plant. And it's hard to find the native one, the Allegheny Spurge. Sassapeak um, natives? Uh, they don't have it. Um, okay. I'd, I'd be willing to share some <laughs> for a limited number of people <laughs> this spring. Uh, it's a beautiful plant. Um, uh, it leaves look somewhat like Pakistander, but much nicer. They're kind of, they're just kind of grayish green and they're not. And is it like a ground cover like a Pakistander? Yeah, it, it's a ground cover like Pakistander. It, it spreads slowly. So it's not going to do what Pakistander does. So you, you, you need a little patience and, uh, but it's, I've had it for like 30 plus years and it's just been wonderful. Do you, um, um, do you need any uh, background of plants prior, prior knowledge, plant knowledge to become a, an, an habitat advisor? Uh, I'm going to turn that over to Kathy. <laughs> yeah. What, I mean, what we ask is that people um, are, committed to gardening, experienced gardeners, um, and or naturalists, um, either self-taught or um, taught um, by becoming a master naturalist or a master gardener. Um, there are people who have had all different kinds of entrees. I think the um, the most important thing is is a real commitment to the natural world and to this project and some background and then the training <laughs> will give everybody a baseline to make sure that everybody has the same um the same set of information about wildlife they're sharing yeah. um i think there Thanks. might be just one more oh two more um um let's see so the kind of mosquito that we believe we have, we, we are calling in the experts to, um, to confirm this, but we have all the mosquitoes, but one of the major problem mosquito is called the tiger mosquito. And you can definitely find more information about that on our website, as well as the DNR website, but um, our website will take you directly to the DNR website. Um, the tiger mosquito is a very aggressive mosquito. It doesn't travel very far. So it's typically, if we have them, it's because they're coming, they're, they're hatching in people's yards. And so that's one of the things the city we're gonna try to educate on and, and try to reduce that. So uh, we don't know for sure, but I'm pretty positive from what I've seen, because a tiger mosquito has the striped legs. So if you see a mosquito and it has stripes, it's a tiger and they are, um, they are not a native species to here. And again, they, um, they're gonna, um, they're gonna be more aggressive. They're the ones that get you through your clothes and, um, and those kinds of things. So if, if that is the case, then we'll, we'll be able to use these gap traps um and um we'll have a discounted uh program for residents and it, they work better um when they're used in a community so you and maybe three of your neighbors you know the more you use them together um the better they work so we're still learning and and our intern is going to teach us more about that but um they've had a they had a pilot program in um university Park, I believe. And so University Park, and that's how I found out. And I was, and I, so I contacted University Park and they don't spray for mosquitoes um, anymore. We still do. And so I'd like to, you know, um, they have eliminated it completely. 
um, and they have this GAT trap program and this educational program. So we're trying, I'm trying to, you know, kind of copy, copy them and, and uh, use the resources they've already developed. And they had an intern for three years. And so, yeah, we're just, I'm just trying to kind of duplicate what they did and see what, see how we, see if we can improve things here, because I know we have a big problem. Um, so that's mosquitoes. Uh, so I, I can, um, I am D T A F is in Frank T is in Tom at Hyattsville.org. You can find me on the city website as well. That's D Taft at Hyattsville.org. And I can send you some information about where to, to find uh, native plants. Um, um, our, there's a couple of books that I have that might be on the website, but if not, I, I, I um, send them out to people uh, when they ask um, and Dave, do you know um, a good place to get native plant seeds? Um, uh, there's a Prairie Moon Nursery. Yeah, that's the one I go That's the one I go to. It's Prairie, Prairie Moon. It's a mail order place. Um, uh, that's a really good place for seed. Um, um, one thing if you really want to get into this uh, is collect your own seed in the wild. Yeah. That's, <laughs> that's I caught somebody down at uh, Driscoll park with these yeah. cute little, they had these cute little white bags, like sachets, you know, that you would uh -huh. put, put potpourri over top of my um, uh, swamp milkweed. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> they were taking my milkweed seed. <laughs> so no, I've tried, I try to do that as well. So um, it's actually a and, fun thing to do uh, to collect the seed, and um, the best place to get seed is these uh, power line cuts. Uh, oh, there's a there's like a prairie ecosystem there. There's oh, wow. a wonderful species of golden raw, all sorts of native plants. Well, I can also tell you that um, we have the city. It's not connected to the incorporate. You know, it's not connected to to me as a city staff. But the Hyattsville, um, what's the Horticultural Society? They do um, they do seed swaps, and they um, they don't always do natives, but they know what's native and what's not native. And so um, you can reach out to the Hyattsville um, Horticultural Society too, and um, they can definitely help. And you know, I think. One of the other things I wanted to mention that Dave might not have mentioned is that you can start these gardens small. Um, and then as you as your plants fill in, you can increase your garden with your own plants. You know, you don't have to buy, you know, or, or um, you don't have to buy everything and you don't have to like worry about getting it all from, I, I, I find that to be one of the best ways to do it is just to start small. And like Dave said, have that intention of growing it bigger. And as your plants fill in and, and you have to really, you know, space them out sometimes when a particular, particular plants can be quite ag aggressive. And um, so you can, you can start small and do it that way. Last question, and I think we should um, wrap it up. Um, Dave, somebody asked, and I hope they're still here. I think that's, oh, I might have more. <laughs> Dave, they can you can contact Dave from the Audubon Wildlife at the Audubon Wildlife Habitat gmail.com down below. Um, you can, con you can uh, send an email there and they will get you in touch with him. Um, there was somebody who wanted to know about the birds and I know it's the size of the hole, but how yeah, do you gonna, stop the sparrows? Yeah, it's, um, well, I believe one and an eighth inch is excludes sparrows. You can look that up uh, on Google. Uh, a one and an eighth inch hole will allow chickadees and uh, wrens, uh, but it excludes sparrows. Unfortunately, a lot of our desirable birds are the same size as a sparrow. But if you put a birdhouse out that the sparrows can fit into, they will uh, they will just kill yeah. whatever's in there. I mean, they're they're really nasty. Uh, so robin's roost is a real cool thing because uh, uh -huh. they uh, 
It's a little like shed. It's like a little. Oh, right. It's a little angle, like a a, a, a 90 degree. Yeah. And that uh, it's a great place for robins and nothing else goes in there. Uh, so there are things you can do. Uh, if you're just doing a little research. Um, and the last one um, is about the uh, doing seeds in a small greenhouse outside starting in February. I definitely... I start seeds. Um, I start my tomatoes in February. Um, uh, what's your experience you, with that? Uh, no, it's good. We've um, uh, at, at Chesapeake Natives, uh, we used to start everything in an unheated greenhouse. Um, uh, we had heat mats underneath, and we kind of sheltered it. If you have source for electricity uh, in that little greenhouse, uh, you can get these really cheap little heat mats. Uh, for plants that I would recommend because that's going to give you a more even temperature and, and you can uh, now I think in February without that you're going to have a hard time uh, getting the temperatures you need for good germination but you know as things warm up things will germinate. Uh, yeah I have a beautiful sunny window in my kitchen and so unfortunately from February <laughs> From February to spring, my kitchen table swaps up against the the um, the window, and I and I start my seeds. I start my seeds indoors in little covered um, covered um, containers um, with the sunlight, and I have a a a light uh, a a plant light mm -hmm. in a fluorescent two bulb fluorescent that that drops on a chain from the ceiling. <laughs> And so as my seedlings grow, I lift the light a little at a time. So there, you can shop get light, Yeah, inexpensive shop lights work great. Yeah, that's... Uh, I, if you have a place in your basement, um, uh, just get, you put those and just, you can keep them a couple inches above the, the seedling. And, you know, there's a lot of different ways, but... Uh, well, this has been so wonderful. Um, I love all the questions. I am so happy to see everybody who's uh, joined in. I hope I did not miss any questions. Um, if we've missed something, please feel free to reach out to me or to the Audubon uh, Wildlife Habitat below. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll do our best to get you um, the information. Um, look forward to getting some Audubon certified yards and and some additional native plants in 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 the city. Okay, thank you. Thanks for everybody for participating. Yeah, thank you so much for coming. Bye. All right. Um, gosh, thanks, Dave and Kathy. Um, wow, they they knocked off quick. There's only eight people now. <laughs> We we really um, were able to uh, let me see if I can.